Amen. Indeed, in Christ there are 10,000 charms, 10,000 blessings that are ours through Christ our Lord. Well, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14 this morning, you can find it on the Pew Bible in front of you on page 874, and I do encourage you to follow along to make sure that these things truly are the Word of God to us as they are given to us from the Gospel of Luke. We'll begin reading at verse 15 in this morning. When one of those who were reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he, that is Jesus, said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those that had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all like began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. The servant said, Sir, what you've commanded has been done. And still there is room. The master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges. Compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word, you may be seated. So we head into the month of June. We are now fully into what is known as wedding season. Perhaps you've been to one or you will be in the coming weeks. And weddings truly are one of the last cultural events where we have formal invitations, invitations that are still sent in the mail to text or email invitations will do almost in any other context today, but for a wedding, that still would be a little bit taboo. And so with that invitation, you get those RSVP cards, those little cards that you're to send back to the host to let them know that you are attending, perhaps even with the selected dinner choice, which are always my favorite RSVPs to send back. Well, recently I saw a mother who was planning her daughter's wedding, and she put on Facebook that the wedding invitations have been sent, but because of the mail trouble that we were and still are having here in the Atlanta area, she put on there, if you do not receive the wedding invitation, please let her know. And I thought, well, how does one know if they've been sent one or not? It'd be quite embarrassing to say, I didn't get one, and to only be told because you weren't sent one. Well, in our passage this morning, we have a similar embarrassment. Not because the invitations weren't sent, and not because the invitations were not received. No, they were both sent and received. But to those that they were sent to, did not come when the banquet was ready. And as a host, how embarrassing it would be to have everything ready and to have nobody come. Well, this host was not going to allow a good banquet to go to waste, and so he invites others. In fact, invites the least and the last and the most unlikely until the house was filled. This is a kingdom parable that Jesus teaches, and it's a rich one, and it's so apt for us. The RSVPs that are sent are from Jesus, the King of Kings. And as a result, we not only need to receive them, not only do we need to be ready, but we need to come and to bring others along with us to this great wedding feast that is given to us, that is the host of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we'll see that this morning in three points, the invitation, and then the rejection, and finally the acceptance. First, the 
invitation. If you've been following along and if you've been with us, you know that this is now the fourth passage here in chapter 14, the fourth teaching of Jesus at the home of a Pharisee. We read this in verse 14, in, or chapter 14, verse 1, that on Sabbath he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees. And we see from this teaching that Jesus made this opportunity to teach on various subjects. And if you ever wanted to think twice of inviting a pastor over for lunch, this might be the passage in which to do it because Jesus not only thoroughly offends the host, but thoroughly offends everyone that's invited. He tells them that they know not the heart of the Sabbath, nor the purpose that it was given. He tells them essentially that they are prideful and self-seeking when they seek the place of honor, seek the place of prominence, that they themselves see themselves as well and in no need. And as we'll see in our passage this morning, that though they have been invited, they have rejected such an invitation and as a result will not taste of the banquet. Again, it's interesting as Jesus confronts the Pharisees and confronts many of his own people, the Jews, he does so not as a belligerent guest or a rabble rouser, as one may call him. He addresses their hard-heartedness to all those that were there that were unwilling to listen, that would not concede to the truth because Jesus would not and will not Compromise on the truth. As Charles Spurgeon once put it, the same sun, that is sun, S-U-N, the same sun which melts wax also hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some people to repentance hardens others in their sin. And that is exactly what we see in this passage is we see the continuing continual hardening of the Pharisees. Yet the, the sun, that is S-O-N, still shines, doesn't he? Still continues to shine the truth, the light upon them. We see it this morning in the last of these four teachings. And he does so in the use of a parable. A parable that comes about because of a comment made by one that was there, one who was reclining at the table. And perhaps this person was too busy eating. Perhaps the sound of his own chewing was too loud and had missed what Jesus was saying prior to this because it does not seem that he has gotten the message because he responds to Jesus' teaching with this comment when in verse 15, blessed is everyone who will eat of bread in the kingdom of God. Blessed is everyone, this man says, that is invited to the banquet. And Jesus uses that comment as an opportunity to speak on the topic of invitation. Essentially, Jesus says, well, let's speak for a moment of those who are invited. And he does so with a parable. And you remember what a parable is. A parable is a story that comes alongside the truth. And so let's examine this story so that we can get to the truth of what Jesus is speaking about. He talks about a man that gave a banquet. In fact, he gave a great banquet, and many were invited. We know from the parallel passage in Matthew that this man wasn't just any man, this man was a king. And as such, he was in a position of authority, a position of responsibility. And as such, honor ought to be given. Now last week we talked about honor and the seat of honor. And that honor is not a bad thing and it's not a wrong thing. It's in fact a good thing and we ought to give honor where honor is due. And with a king, you would think that is quite obvious. Because he's the king, since there are none higher than him in the land, that his very position would deem him worthy of 
honor. Now we can think of many earthly kings, we can even think of many earthly presidents, perhaps, or elected officials that are not so honorable, and yet they still ought to be honored because of their position. But with this king, there does not seem to be any tension in who he was as well as what he was. In fact, he was to be doubly honored because he was an honorable king, both in his person as well as in his position. And why do we know that? Well, because he's throwing a banquet, as it says, a a great banquet. It demonstrates that he has a care for others, that he wasn't just thinking of himself. He was inviting others to, to join him, to join in the celebration. Well, we know that to be a very profound truth that Jesus is trying to convey to those listeners that day, that he's trying to convey to us regarding the kingdom of God. And this ought to change our worldview. What is that? Well, when we think of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, what is Jesus likening it to? He's likening it to a feast, a banquet, a celebration. In other words, it's not a funeral. We go to funerals essentially out of obligation, don't we? Hopefully a a willing obligation because you love the person that is deceased. You love the family of the deceased person and so you go to show your, your support. You go to show your love to that family. But none of us go, yippee, a funeral. What fun. We don't associate fun with funeral, nor do we necessarily associate celebration. Well, we can celebrate those that die in the Lord. That is a good thing, but funerals themselves, we don't think of celebrations or parties. A kingdom of God is not a funeral. Christianity is not a funeral. Church is not a funeral. We shouldn't come in mourning. We don't come playing a dirge. No, we we do mourn a death, the death of our Savior and the sin that has placed him there. But Jesus is no longer dead, is he? He is not on the cross. He is living and alive. And through Christ, we are living and alive. And that should bring about profound joy and, in fact, jubilee. I would even propose to you celebration. Is that how you think of Christianity? Is that how you think of church? Let me ask you, is that how you come this morning? Do you merely come out of obligation? Or perhaps this morning when your feet hit the floor as you got out of bed and you are reminded that this was Sunday, that this was the Lord's day, there was a little pep in your step. There was a little skip in your soul, as it were. Why? Because this is a feast day of the soul. It's the banquet day with the people of God. And we see that even as it's portrayed in front of us this morning, don't we, with the Lord's table, that the the Lord has given us his table, that we can come and, and eat and drink with him along with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but we also have the first Sunday lunch today as well, don't we? All of that should bring excitement, That should bring joy, that should bring celebration. And that's exactly what Jesus says is the kingdom of God. It is like a great banquet that is hosted by the king. It is a spiritual celebration. And that is something that we should rejoice in because that is something that the world knows nothing about. And the world doesn't get it, do they? I love the scene, perhaps you've seen it, it's a little bit older movie now of the Peter Pan movie Hook with Robin Williams. And if you've seen that movie, then you know as Peter comes into Neverland and he sits down to eat, he doesn't see any food. But it seems like all of those that are around him are are eating, and not only are they eating, but they are feasting. And Peter doesn't see the food because he doesn't have the eyes or the imagination to see it. But when he does, what happens? 
He sees that the table is, is indeed filled with, with food and delicious food and abundance of food. For the Christian, the things feasted upon the Lord's day is not imaginary. It's more real than the physical food that we eat. In fact, it's the very thing that the world longs for and yet never finds because they look in all the wrong places. Ed Welch, who is a Christian counselor, has a book on addiction. And I love the title of it. It is called Addiction, A Banquet in the Grave. And that is such an apt description, isn't it, of addiction. And we think of alcohol, when we think of drugs, when we think about food or pornography, it provides nothing that lasts. In fact, it provides only death. It only brings about death. That's why it's a banquet in the grave. But Christ brings life. Only in him life is found. We come not to a banquet in the grave as the things of the world does, but the banquet of the king. We come to a life-giving feast. We come to a soul-satisfying supper. It's to that banquet that the invitations have been sent and have been, in fact, prepared for. We see that in verse 17 as the the master sends them out. He says, as the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to those that were invited. Everything has been ready by the king. And now he sends the the servants out to to go and tell all those that have been invited to come. And did you notice, it's a small point, but did you notice what the message is? that was to be conveyed by the servants. Notice there in verse 17, come for everything is now ready. Everything is ready. This is not a potluck. You don't have to bring your favorite casserole to it, do you? This is not a BYO anything at all. You don't have to take anything. You don't even need to ask, what can I bring? No, all is provided. As the hymn goes, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Everything that is needed has been provided for, it's been taken care of. That's how we come to Christ, isn't it? That's how we come to this banquet. All is ready. In fact, the, again, the parallel passage in Matthew, it talks about even the wedding garbs that are given are provided for you, that you come dressed and only what Christ provides, dressed in Christ's righteousness. But notice what happens as a response to this invitation. Well, we see, first of all, rejection, don't we? If the king was throwing a banquet, you would think that it would be quite an honor to be invited to such a banquet as this. Who would not want to come to a banquet that is hosted by the king? Even if you had plans, you would change them, right? And you would do so willing. Some of you can remember the royal weddings that have taken place over the last several years if you're into such things. As one of my favorite memes put it, I haven't cared about the royal family since 1776. My British friends always appreciate that one. (laughs) But if you think about the royal weddings, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure I would imagine there was a 100% acceptance rate. I doubt anyone turned that invitation down. Why? To, To be invited to that would be seen as a privilege, be seen as an honor. It was the, the, the must event of the year. If you were invited to it, it meant that you were somebody. There was some prestige to it. Well, we see that is not the case in this parable, is it? In fact, it is quite the opposite. When the banquet is ready, many do not come. In fact, it says in verse 18, but they all alike began to make 
excuses, and we see some of these excuses. In fact, three of the excuses of those that were invited, and indeed, they are excuses. One says, I've bought a field, and therefore I cannot come because I need to go and see it. Please have me excused. Another says, I've bought five yoke of oxen. That means a a minimum of 10 oxen. You you notice that these were not small purchases. These were large purchases. It would be like saying, "I, I bought a house, or I bought a car, or I bought five cars, but I have yet to see them. Now I need to to go see them, to see what I've purchased, what I've bought. They are bought sight unseen. Who would do such a thing as that? And even if you did, there's no reason that it couldn't wait until after the wedding, until after the banquet. The field obviously is not going anywhere, is it? Verse 20, we see another excuse. It says, I've married a wife. I cannot come again. None of that would have precluded this individual and even this couple from coming to the banquet. We see that all are excuses. It's right up there with, I can't go out. I need to wash my hair. It's essentially the the type of excuse that is being given here. It would have been ridiculous in the first century modern ears of those that Jesus was speaking to. But what is Jesus' point? It demonstrates that there is something deeper, that there is a heart condition, not only of indifference. It's not that they can't. It's because they won't. But there's no desire. There's no heart to go to this banquet. Children, this would be like your parents telling you to to clean your room. You'd go, oh, I don't want to do that. Or having to go to the dentist, you would think, oh, I'll I'll avoid that at all cost. That's how these individuals treated this banquet. But we see that it's more than just indifference, isn't it? It's willful, stubborn rejection. In fact, it is rebellion. Remember, this is coming from the king. And this was essentially the attitude of most of the Jews. This didn't summarize the the whole of the Jewish people, but this is largely how many came across in this invitation to come. There was more than just indifference. There was rejection. There was rebellion. Listen to how the Apostle John summarizes it in his gospel, in his prologue, in John chapter one. This is the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He, that is Jesus, came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Jesus came with truth, came with salvation, came with life to his own people. And their response, no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. I have no need for this. Even more, I don't want it. Is that any different than today? As for centuries, the message has gone out that Christ is the answer, that Christ is the reason for hope, that God has sent his son into this world for salvation, that we may be saved, that we may be redeemed, that we may enter into all of the good things that God would have for his creation and specifically for us as his creatures. And yet, what is largely the world's response? Now we're good. Really? Are we good? When we look at the world, when we look at culture, when we look at society, we would say, no, we're not good, are we? In fact, there's a lot of things as we look out and see that are not good. And when we look at ourselves, we also have to say, there is a lot of things that are not good that we need an answer. We need a solution that Jesus is that answer. He is that solution. And yet, 
what does the world by and large say? We will accept anything. We'll be tolerant of all except that, which is Christ. You see that it's more than indifference. It's rebellion. It's rejection. It's close-fisted defiance against God and against his Christ that he has been sent for our good, has been sent for our salvation. And it's not just a no, it's an obstinate no. It's a hard-hearted no. It demonstrates how darkened is the heart and mind of man, that indeed we are dead in our sins and our transgressions. And maybe that would be some of you that are here today that have continually said, no to Christ and said no to the things of Christianity. And perhaps you've phrased it in these excuses, excuses like those that were sent this invitation. You know, I would like to, but life is a little busy right now. Or I'm not sure that this whole Christianity thing is true. Or I don't know if Christ is truly the only way. You must recognize, you must be honest with yourself that it's not just excuses, it's rebellion. It's rejection. It's rejection from the Lord's call, from his invitation, from his command to, call, to come and to feast and to banquet with him. And so would your heart stop making those excuses? Would you stop in your rebellion and in your rejection? And would you no longer say no, no longer say not right now, no longer say maybe later, but when Christ says come, that you would say yes. And that you would come with a, a willing and repentant heart while there is still time. Because you see what happens when the servant reports back that all made excuses, that all were not coming. It says in verse 21, the master of the house became angry. And this is right and righteous anger. This is the right response to heart rebellion because it is a holy anger. It's a pure anger. It's not an anger out of malice or out of spite. It's an anger because the gift, the most precious gift that God could give is being rejected. If you made a plate of cookies for your neighbor this week and your neighbor rejected the cookies, you would be offended, wouldn't you? You'd be offended that your cookies were not accepted. How much more the son? How much more the beloved son that is given to us in Christ Jesus? Yes, God is sovereign in election, but no one on the day of judgment will be able to say to God, I wanted to come, but you were not willing to have me. No, mankind will be damned for their own heart indifference. And in fact, because of their rebellion to this call, it's not because of lack of willingness in God. Well, we see third there in the light of such rejection that the door was closed to some and opened to others. And so third, we see this act of acceptance. We see that the master tells the servants to go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city. And he tells them to, to bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame, the, the very same people that were mentioned last week in verse 13. And as we said then, as we will say now, that there are no spiritual benefits per se of being poor or, or being disabled. Other than this, that those that are poor, those that are disabled have need. And that need obviously demonstrates a, a greater need, a, a need for Christ. And in fact, that is how we need to see ourselves. Again, that we are not well, but that we are sick, that we are needy. Again, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. It's only the poor in spirit that will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's only those that recognize their need that will enter into the kingdom of God. And that is what Jesus was saying. That is what Jesus is saying in this passage. Those that the Pharisees looked down upon are those that are entering in before them. 
In fact, Jesus says this very specifically in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 31 when he says, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. And if that wasn't offensive enough, that these poor and crippled and blind and lame are going in before these Pharisees, Jesus even offends them more when they say to Jesus or say to the master, we, we've done that and there's still room. And so the master said to the servant, verse 23, go out to the highways and to the hedges. Now, the Pharisees and the Jews would have known exactly what this meant. That this meant the nations. That this meant the goyim. This meant the Gentiles. That this is what Jesus is giving for the plan of salvation. That with the rejection of the Jews, it is now opening the door to the Gentiles. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, that salvation is to everyone who believes first the Jew and then also the Greek. He goes on to speak of this in Romans chapter 11, that the branches were cut off so that the Gentiles could be grafted in. And what Jesus is saying here is with their rejection, the branch is being cut off, and it is opening the door for another to come and be able to be grafted in, to come into this banquet and to be received and to be accepted so that there would be one vine, that there would be one church, that there would be one people of God, one family of God, of believing Jews as well as believing Gentiles. Because God is not just the God of the Jews, he's the God of the nations. And we need to be reminded of that as well, don't we? That God is not just the God of America, is he? He's the God of South America. He's the God of Africa. He's the God of Asia. He's the God of the whole world. And therefore, we must always have that global perspective. But do you see in this parable that Jesus was and is laying out the plan? The invitation is going out is going out even this day through his servants, through the preaching of his word. And the message is always the same, that all is ready. All has been prepared. You just need to come. You need not bring anything. As the hymn says, all that he requires is to feel your need of him. And this he gives you. And so come. Why tarry? This invitation requires, yes, full submission, full surrender, full sacrifice. You must come on his terms or you do not come at all, but you are coming unto a feast. You're coming unto a banquet, a banquet of delight. What our souls long for, what our souls were created for. As we heard earlier in the assurance of pardon from Song of Solomon that his banner over us is love. And I believe this parable is so poignant for us because Jesus is speaking to his covenant people. And there is an important understanding of the covenant in this passage, the covenant that is throughout the scriptures. See, oftentimes people equate covenant with salvation. That covenant equals salvation. Well, salvation is offered through the covenant along with all of the blessings of the kingdom, but only those in the covenant who enter in through Christ, by Christ, will receive those things. See, don't make the same mistake that the Jews were making. They thought that because they were people of the covenant, they were therefore saved. Remember what brought about this entire parable was this man saying, blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, blessed are we. Blessed are the Jews because we're going to enter into this banquet. We're going to eat this bread, this bread that is given in the kingdom of God. In other words, because they were Jews, because they were the people of the covenant, because they had circumcision, they therefore automatically were able to enter into the banquet. They were able to enter into salvation. And Jesus' whole point in this is saying, let's talk about that. Just because you're externally a part of the covenant, 
yet reject the invitation, the invitation that was given first to the Jews, God's covenant people, that invitation was rejected. Yes, the Jews, many of them were externally a part of the covenant. Yes, they had the sign of the covenant, circumcision, but they never entered into the true heart of the covenant. They never came to Christ. They rejected Christ. And the same is true today. We are brought into the covenant through baptism. And many think baptism equals salvation. Salvation equals baptism. That's what our Baptist brothers would say. No, we say baptism equals the covenant, the covenant sign that is given to us and given to our children. Lord willing, we will see that again next week, that God is making a covenant with us and with our children, that through this baptism, they are being brought into the local and visible church And they are given all the promises of the covenant, all the benefits of the invisible church, the church universal. But they must enter in. They must come to faith in Christ as must we all. Do you understand that it's all hollow without Christ? The external covenant must always lead to the eternal realities of the covenant, which is Christ. I mentioned this to you just to a few weeks ago, and some of you found this to be helpful. It's like a trust fund. You can have millions of dollars that is put in the trust fund, but that does you nor your children any good if it's never accessed. The covenant without Christ is the same way. It has all the blessings, all the benefits, but if you never tap into it, you never receive it. Baptism without embracing Christ is worthless. The covenant without Christ is worthless. That's what Jesus is saying here to his own people, his own covenant people. He's saying you've been given the invitation. The invitation has been sent and yet you've rejected it. You've been given the promises. The promise, in fact, is right before you. The visible promise in the visible Christ that is standing before them and yet what is their heart doing? It is rejecting them. They're not embracing Christ. Do you see how this is so important for us that we must embrace Christ by faith? Christ is the door. He is the one that says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one that says, come and eat for the feast is ready. And you might wonder, why would I preach this to a church full? Haven't we all already come? Well, I hope so. I hope that each and every one of you that have heard my voice have responded to this invitation that has been sent to you by Christ, but I never want to assume. I never want to assume just because you're here or have been here for years that you have come to Christ. Yes, you've been externally a part of the church, but internally you've never entered into the realities. And children and youth, I especially plead with you This is what needs to happen with you. Yes, you've come to the the font of baptism. Yes, you've been given the sign of the covenant, but now enter into the realities of the covenant, which are given to us by Christ. And even if you have come, it doesn't mean that you stop coming. No, we continue to come. We never stop coming. No more than we stop ever stop coming to the to the fridge or to the supper table to eat, do we? We continue to come because the invitation is for us to come, to come and eat until our souls are fully satisfied only in Christ. And what a delight it is to do so. RSVPs have been sent. All are invited. Those that were just once limited to the Jewish people That is no more. And no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, in fact, one commentator puts it this way, however far you have plunged into evil, no matter how degraded by sin you've become, however distant from him you may be, you're still invited. That is the level of grace that is given to us 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's grace that has come all the way down to save us from our wretchedness. And in so doing, as we come to eat, we, we bring others along. Did you notice what Jesus or the master here says to the servants? He says, compel people to come in. What a strong word that is. It's a pleading, it's an insisting, it's an entreating, it's an active word, it's an active engagement, it's an active evangelism. And as we compel, we we pray that God would open up their hearts so that they would be willing to come, that they would desire to come. Again, who would not want to come to a banquet provided by the king? And if that is what we have here below, how much greater will the full measure be of the wedding banquet of all of eternity, days without end? What a pleasure and a joy that will be. I'll finish with this. Dale Ralph Davis in his commentary tells a story of a soldier, true, true story of a soldier that was serving in Vietnam. And he was concerned that his wife, who was stateside, wouldn't receive their anniversary card that he sent And so Ronald Reagan, who at the time was the governor of California, heard about this, and since this wife, this woman, lived in his state, wanted to make sure that this woman knew that her husband loved her and was concerned for her. And so what did he do? Well, you'd think the sensible thing, would he pick up the phone and that he would call her? No, he went beyond that. He went and got a dozen roses, and he delivered them as the governor of the state, to the house. And not only did he deliver them, he stayed for a visit. He stayed for a few hours, in fact, just to speak with her, just to talk to her, just to allow her to know how much she was loved by her husband and how appreciative he as the governor was that her husband had given of himself in this service, as well as the dedication that she had shown in staying home and taking care of the kids. And you hear of such a story and you go, wow, what a governor. A governor that would do all of that for a military wife. My friends, how much more our Lord who came all the way down for us, who spread the table before us and spread it not just with bread and wine but with his body and blood so that we could be filled, so that we could feast with him. Again, all in anticipation of the great wedding feast of the Lamb that is yet to come. And so, my friends, hear the words of your Lord, your Master, your King. Come, for everything is ready. Join me in prayer. Lord, we praise you for such an invitation. What a joy, what a privilege it is that we would receive such, and that is what we receive every time that we hear the gospel, Lord. Would we have hearts that are not hardened, but that would respond, that would respond in faith, and not just respond once, not just respond to a time to pray the sinner's prayer, but would respond each and every time the gospel is given. As our Lord Jesus Christ would call us to come, we would say, we are coming, Lord that our souls, in fact, delight to come, desire to come, to come and eat and feast with you, O Lord. And so, Lord, as we come to this table this day, we pray that we would come with that attitude, with that response, with that joy and celebration in our hearts for what is given to us in Christ. For indeed, it is overwhelming that you loved us enough you would send our, your son as an atoning sacrifice for all of our sins, that we could be redeemed, that we could be saved, that we could be the creatures that you created us to be, giving you worship and praise, not only this day, this week, but indeed for all of eternity. What a privilege it is. We praise you for it. We pray this all in Christ, our Savior's name. Amen.